Hello everyone, welcome to uh, another meeting for our class and um, I appreciate everyone tuning in um, <clears throat> for today's class uh, virtually. If you'd like to comment and I encourage you to comment, I'm going to post this right on Google Classroom and so if you'd like to post uh, a question or you want to comment, you can do it right on the post for everyone to see. You're, you're welcome to comment or ask questions uh, on, the, on those posts and you're also welcome to comment on each other's comment or questions all right as part of uh, our class engagement and participation so uh, I'm recording this uh, today um, on the Feast of All Saints and so I'm going to say the prayer of uh, for, for this All Saints Day and I invite you to join me in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Dear Father, you have given the saints in heaven eternal happiness, and they now live in the fullness of your glory. Because of their holy love for you, they also care about us and our families, my friends, our, church, our friends, our churches, and our neighbors. Thank you for the gift of their friendship and the witness of their holy, holy lives. We ask our patron saints and every saint who has become specially dear to us to intercede for us. We ask them to help us journey safely on the narrow path that leads to heaven. O Lord, give us their protection. Grant us their assistance in overcoming temptation and gaining the fullness of life with you. Amen. All the saints pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So uh, once again, thank you for, for joining us. We're going to talk about two important topics today. Um, we're going to continue with our discussion on the sacrament of healing, particularly on the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And then we're going to go right into holy orders. So this class is probably going to be a little shorter because we, don't, we won't really have the discussion that we normally have in class. Um, so um, uh, it, should, it should go pretty quickly. Uh, also, secondly, if there are any questions that you did want to bring up um, from today's presentation, you can bring it up the next class, the next time we meet. Or, once again, you can post and comment on Google Classroom. I want to thank Father Joe Adamson, our retired priest here, one of our retired priests from Mary Mother of Mercy, for helping record this presentation. So today we're, gonna go right, we're going to go over the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Uh, while... This is one of the sacraments that only a priest or a bishop can administer. It nonetheless, it does have an effect on your ministry as deacons. Uh, and it, it's good for you to have a, um, a good knowledge of this material, especially because you're going to be spending a lot of your time as a deacon visiting the sick and visiting the infirm and the homebound. So first of all, the, the scriptural root for uh, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick can be found in... James chapter 5 verses 14 to 16 and this actual verse is actually uh, part of the uh, rite of the anointing of the sick so when the priest uh, initiates uh, or introduces the sacrament this is part of the introduction and let's read this together is any among you sick let them send for the priests or for the presbyters of the church and some translations it's elders of the church, but they all mean the same thing. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. So... As we can see from, from this passage, this is the scriptural root for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. But we're, we're, we, all can, we can also see in this, in this scriptural passage the purpose and the effects of this particular sacrament. All right? We can see that um, there is a salvific, all right? there's a salvific uh, a component to, to, the, uh, to, to this uh, sacrament. Um, and um, hope for the resurrection, the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed any sins, the sins will be forgiven, forgiveness of sins, all right? Um, it doesn't negate the sacrament of reconciliation, which we talked about the last class, all right? In fact, it, 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 
it reinforces the need to confess our sins to one another. All right, and of course, uh, the last uh, effect would be healing. So it, th this particular passage is really packed with what this sacrament is about. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, just in general what the sacrament of the anointing of the sick consists of. All right, so it is a sacrament of healing. Okay, and it gives health primarily to the soul. Um, it strengthens the soul, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. But it is also a sacrament of healing physically. And so we know that there had been instances, if the Lord wills it, that the person might be healed uh, physically as well. So there is a physical and a spiritual component to the healing that it confers. It confers all the time a special grace on the person who is receiving it, especially if they are suffering from grave illness or just exhaustion from old age. Um, so it, it strengthens them, it gives them hope. Um, you know, in many ways, it, it, you know, one of the things that happens to people when they're sick or when they're homebound and they're alone and lonely, you know, one of the things that happens is that they get depressed and, and in many ways this, this also is a healing for mental health in, in so many ways. If needed, it also confers a special grace on the person to accept God's will and prepare for death. So yes, there, there is that um, component to the preparation for death. So this is not a sacrament, for example, that you, know, you, 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 you get because you have a cold and a few sniffles. That's not what this is for. All right, this is, it has to be for something serious or something that's chronic and ongoing. Um, why illness can harm a person's soul, all right, and can cause that person to be self-centered and they, they focus on their suffering and nothing else. You know, they get depressed, they get, they get um, you know, to the point where they're, they're, they're losing that Christian hope. And so the sacrament of the anointing gives them that, that, that peace, gives them that, that um, redirection in, in their life. And so that redirection involves the person moving to acceptance, to surrender, and to peace. So generally, this is what the sacrament does. And we'll, we'll talk about the particular effects, the graces of the sacraments, but this is what it does. So, whenever the celebration takes place, okay, like other sacraments, it is a liturgy. It's not just a, a drive-by kind of thing, all right? Um, it is a celebration. It is uh, one of the liturgical acts of the church. Therefore, it is a public act of the church, all right? Even though it might happen in people's homes, it might happen in hospitals or nursing homes, it's still a public act. It's still a public act because what we are doing is that we're bringing the prayers also of the church to those who are to be anointed. It is only to be administered by the priest or the bishop, okay? So uh, as permanent deacons, you would not be able to administer the sacrament, um, but uh, a priest and a bishop can. There are four principal elements to the sacrament. There's the laying on of hands, all right? So uh, right at the beginning, what I, uh, what I would do is that I would lay the hand lay my hands on the person's head all right so there is that laying on of hands and then after that there is the the prayer over the person that accompanies the laying on of hands and then there is the anointing of the forehead and the anointing of the hand so um you know you the priest would anoint the forehead just like you would at a baptism or confirmation and then the two palms the two hands in here um, there's been questions, uh, just, this is just an aside, sometimes I remember when I was, um, um, I, got, I, 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 I encountered an accident and, and there was a, a person who was, who was dead right on the, uh, or was probably dying right on the scene and I remember administering the sacrament to that person. Um, in those instances, obviously, you know, it, it might be impossible to anoint the person on the forehead, on the hand, so... Um, you just anoint the person wherever you can in those instances. But that's a very rare, rare kind of situation. But, you know, the, the point is you want to make sure that the person is anointed. Ideally, ideally, when, when the sacrament is celebrated, it should be celebrated 
with the sacrament of penance and the sacrament of the Eucharist. So um, this is one of the things I regularly do when I do visit the sick. You know, I offer them the opportunity to, to uh, receive the sacrament of penance, to go to confession, and then we go right into the anointing of the sick, and then it then leads and concludes with uh, the reception of Holy Communion. Um, so, uh, so, so just keep that in mind, that, um, and I'll go over a little bit about some pastoral considerations. Keep in mind that that, that would be the ideal situation. Um, Obviously, there are instances when one is not able to uh, administer the sacrament of penance and, and the sacrament of the Eucharist. So therefore, in those instances, I would normally just anoint the person. Um, I'll go over that a little bit in a few moments, um, how, how that works. So who should receive the sacrament? Okay, I, I mentioned in the beginning that there has to be some serious reasons for a person to receive the sacrament. You know, it's not something that you receive because you have some aches and pains in your back or, you know, you have uh, a few sniffles here and there. That's not what this is for. So first of all, a person has to have reached the age of reason, all right? The age of reason in the church is, is seven. And they have to be, in other words, they have to be capable of sinning, all right? You cannot receive the sacrament of of healing and forgiveness if there's nothing to be forgiven or healed. Uh, for those who are just moments from death, so yes, that hasn't changed, all right? Um, one of the things that, that, one of the preconceived notions that people have is that, well, it's only for those who are dying. Yes, it is for those who are dying, but it is a lot more than that. It is also for those who are undergoing a serious treatment, all right? So someone, let's say, who's on chemo or has a serious disease, a debilitating disease, all right, serious illness or disease, or a serious operation due to a serious illness. So, you know, you're not going to, to the hospital because you, you're, you're, you're having a facelift or something, you know. You're going because you have a serious illness. Or someone who is in danger of death due to illness or old age. There is actually um, a component to the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that was known as the extreme unction or the last rites or the last blessing. So there is that prayer, it's called the apostolic pardon. And um, it, it is something that the priest can give and, and should give, all right, uh, if a person is in danger of death or close to death. This is also known as the last rites. It's really a prayer that the priest can give. It is not a prayer that the priest gives for those who are not in danger of death. So, for example, if a person is receiving the sacrament of the anointing of the sick because they have a serious illness, a chronic illness, or go undergoing an operation, I obviously would not say this, <laughs> all right, because uh, it's very explicit that they're preparing for death, and, you know, it might, uh, it might freak out the people that, that are receiving the sacrament. But, this is a prayer that is within the, the, the ritual that the priest can say. But it's not automatic. It's not automatic. All right? So it's called the apostolic pardon. Um, so it's a very important prayer, and especially if a person is in danger of death. Uh, a question might be asked, well, what, Father, what if you give the apostolic pardon and the person ends up not dying and they end up living? Well. In, in which case, well, we're, we're, we're thankful to the Lord that the, uh, the person survived and the person is well. Uh, obviously, the, the, the sacrament did its job. So, you know, they can get, receive that again if and when the time comes. Uh, but it, it is for the purposes of those who are on the last journey of death. Okay? So that's the apostolic part. So this, this, these are the... And then lastly, it can, this, the sacrament can be repeated if the situation becomes serious. So um, the person can receive it again. Uh, so ideally, you would want a person to receive this, the, to receive the sacrament, um, when, um, you know, when the person is really in grave danger health-wise or is about to, to go through a very difficult illness, and not necessarily dying, but going through a very difficult stage in their illness, they should really receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Um, now, 
what if the person is unconscious? Okay, and this happens a lot of times. You know, I would go to the hospital or the nursing home. Uh, you know, people would be unconscious or they're sleeping. You can't really, you know, you can't really wake them up or you don't, there's no need to wake them up or they're not really coherent. They're not able to, to, to speak and understand fully what's going on. It can be given conditionally, all right, and presumptively to people who are unconscious. So we're, we are conditionally giving the sacrament to them and assuming that if they were conscious and they are fully aware of what's going on, that they would be receptive to the grace of the sacrament and that they would be sorry for their sins. That's what we're presuming, okay? Um, and it can also be given to people who have just died, all right? Um, usually it's within a couple of hours after uh, death has been announced by the medical team. Uh, and the reason we can do that, one is for pastoral reasons, all right? It's very important for the person who, who has just died. And it's also important for the family to know, okay, you know, my loved one received the sacrament of the church. But also from a very pragmatic point of view, we don't really know exactly when the soul leaves the body, all right? And so the soul may still benefit from, from the sacrament. Um, one of the things I, I, I often, you know, whenever it's, it's close to that two-hour time, um, one of the things I, I, I would often do is I, I'd rather earn the side of caution. I mean, I earn the side of charity, you know, so... Um, I think it's very important uh, as a priest to, to, to be able to approach sacrament and to administer the sacrament, offering that hope and offering that peace, um, you know, not just to the person who died, but also to the families. So most of the time I do that. Now, obviously, if, if uh, there had been instances when I would, I would anoint a person who just died and they died yesterday, obviously I, I'm not able to administer the sacrament to that person. I, uh, what I usually do is I, I offer the prayers for the dead, which can be found in the, the sacrament of the sick um, ritual book. Um, so I would, I would do that. I would pray for the prayers after death. I would, there's also prayers there for, uh, for the families and friends who are gathered. And you can, you can even do those prayers too. You know, um, maybe you might find yourself in a situation where you're waiting for the priest to arrive and you want to offer some prayers, there are those prayers after death that you can, you can pray, as well as prayers before death that you can also pray with, with, the, you know, with, with, the, with the faithful. Um, so I've had only a couple of these instances where I had to administer it to someone, uh, but technically once rigor mortis sets in, you know, uh, you probably can't administer the, the sacrament because the person has been has been um, dead for a while and, and more than likely the, the soul has already left the body. All right? So those are the, the, the requirements for who should receive the sacrament. So what are the effects of the sacrament? First of all, there are the spiritual effects that I spoke, I, I, I talked about. Union with the passion of Christ. We're uniting our suffering and our conditions to that of Christ on the cross. Person is given strength, peace, and the courage to endure in a Christian manner uh, the sufferings or illness that they're, they're enduring in old age. There is the forgiveness of sins. So this kicks in retroactively, the forgiveness of sins, if the person is unable to go to the sacrament of confession. So when I go, if a person is, is able to go to confession, all right, they don't have, uh, you know, dementia that, uh, and it disables them from going to confession and they're conscious, they're alert, I would usually say, okay, do you want to go to confession? And usually they, they do. And then I would give them confession before I administer the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. But if they're not able to go to confession, it takes care of that. Again, it's a, uh, it's a conditional and presumptive presumptive administration that if the person had the opportunity they would be forgiven of their sins. That's also in, in, the, in the scriptural root that we read earlier on. And it restores a sanctifying grace. All right, uh, when, when you are forgiven of your sins and you receive the sacrament, it restores 
that, that the life of God within us that we received at our baptism. Restoration to health in mind, body, and spirit, all right? Um, sometimes not the body, but certainly in, in mind and spirit. If a person is dying, there, there is that, again, that preparation for passage for eternal life. And also there is the reduction or removal of all the punishment due to sin, all right? Um, time that you, we spend in purgatory is, is reduced. Yeah. So it, it purifies us. Again, it's that preparation for death. And most of these spiritual benefits are meant uh, uh, when the person is still alive and conscious, all right? So, it, it, again, it highlights the reason why we, we, sh we, we shouldn't and we don't have to wait until the person is at death's door. Yes, by all means, if a person is at death's door and dying, yes, you, you should definitely, the person should definitely receive the sacrament. But, but, it behooves us to deny a person to receive the sacrament while they're entering into a difficult part in, of their illness, all right? It, we really need to make sure that, you know, we want, we want to give them hope. We want to let them know of the prayers of, of, of the saints, the prayers of the church, especially in this most difficult moment in their life. And so they should receive the sacrament, uh, you know, uh, while they're still alive and while they're still conscious. And I always say this to people, it, it's uh, even to my parishioners, you know, don't wait until you're at death's door. And there's a practical reason to it. What's the practical reason? Well, you know, I'm not just sitting in my rectory waiting and twiddling my thumbs and waiting for someone to call me because they're dying, all right? I mean, with the short number of priests that we have, with, with a lot of uh, demands in, within the parish, we're not always there to be able to um, you know, to come to a person's home to administer the, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. You know, we do our best and we prioritize that. But gone are the days when you have four or five priests living in the rectory where, you know, someone can just go just like that to, to administer the sacrament. So it's very important that as, as clergy, we communicate this to the people that we visit. And I'm sure you visit a lot of people who are sick and, and suffering. If not, you will be doing that definitely as a deacon, and this is one of the one of the service that you can provide your pastors and your priests and the church and them is to remind them to receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Um, yes, you know we, we have to get pe move people away from this stigma that, that you know you're receiving the sacrament because you're dying. It's not just for those who are imminently dying; it's also for those who are seriously ill or, or old and infirm, all right? So it's important that we communicate that. <laughs> Although uh, some priests do have what they call a reputation for black thumb, <laughs> you know, when they, when they visit the sick, uh, you know, they're dead the next day. So uh, I don't think I, I have that yet, but you know. Um, but anyway, important thing is get them anointed, all right? If, if they're, they're, they're in they're, they're in, the, in the midst of a serious illness or they're suffering uh, from that illness, you know, you should encourage them to be anointed. Some pastoral considerations, some things to really keep in mind, especially in your ministry as a deacon, all right? Visiting the sick, all right, especially those who are gravely ill is a corporal work of mercy, all right? You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not always pleasant, all right? Uh, but it is a requirement, you know, our, our Lord made it very clear that this is one of the things that we Christians do and we have to do, all right? It's a corporal work of mercy. Likewise, likewise, you know, praying for the dead, all right? And prayers and, and uh, burying the dead, they're both spiritual and corporal acts of mercy. Um, our presence alone, and this is something very important, can be a sign of support and encouragement for the people that we see, all right? When you visit them, allow the person to lead the conversation. And for some, you know, they might share with you their ailments. They might share with you some of their problems, some of the things that's, that's preoccupying their minds and hearts. And this can be very therapeutic for them uh, and can help them bear and accept their illness. And, 
And oftentimes those discussions could actually lead you to say, hey, you know, do you want a priest? Do you want Father to come and visit you to, to administer the sacrament of the anointing of the sick? And you can explain to them all the wonderful spiritual benefits that we just talked about. Advise those who meet the requirements, so if they meet the requirements, to receive the sacrament. All right? Ask them or their family members if they would like a priest to be sent to receive the sacrament. Okay? And um, one of the things, too, that the family members can do is that they can, they can and should be present when the priest administers the sacrament. You know, some, some families, when I visit homes or when I visit the hospital or nursing homes, you know, they, they excuse themselves. And I said, no, no, you know, you should be here praying with us, all right, uh, praying for, the, for your loved one. So this can also be very helpful for family members. Again, to help them, uh, you know, face the inevitable. Tell them that they do not need to delay and should not wait the last minute to send for a priest. And I talked about that already. It's important that we explain to the person in the family that the anointing of the sick can help the ill person accept the seriousness of their condition and the graces of the sacrament. This is what it's about. Okay. All right. So that's, those are the pastoral considerations for, um, and, and, and the topic of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Um, so if you have any comments or questions, feel free to, you know, post them. I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is the sacrament of holy orders. So let me, just bear with me for a moment as I change the slides. Okay. So we're going to move into the Sacrament of Holy Orders. And the next week when we meet, um, we're, going to, um, we're going to talk about the Sacrament of Marriage. So let's see. Okay. So I'm having some technical difficulties, so we'll just wait a little bit. So... make sure that for some reason that's not really coming up hold on We have these technical difficulties. Well, you can take a little break as we're having these technical difficulties. I, I, I guess this would be the natural time for the break. But All right, let's try this again and see if that, if that works. Nope, doesn't work. It's uh, odd that we're not... All right. So here is what we're going to do since the, um, going to, I'm just going to pull up the slides and, and we'll, we'll, we'll go to that right now because of the fact that I can't seem to, all right. So let's go over the sacrament of, let me just get my mouse, sacrament of holy orders, all right. So who can be ordained? So there are a couple of pictures in here that I have on the screen. Um, these are pictures from my ordination and I think I've mentioned to you that I was ordained um, in the uh, same church where I am now currently the pastor. So it's gone over some, some changes. So for example, uh, the carpet is no longer in, in, in the church. It's now, uh, um, we have these beautiful um, tiles that, that, that adorns the church. So anyway, who can be ordained? Uh, there are three degrees of the priesthood. There is the episcopate, the bishop, the presbyterate priest, and the diaconate and the deacon. 
each degree is a distinct calling, as we discussed, you know, last week in class, all right? You're, for example, like, uh, as I've said, you're not a deacon because you didn't make the cut to the priesthood, all right? Uh, you're not a deacon because, you know, you were a failure as a seminarian. It's a distinct calling, all right? Each one of us are called to the priesthood, to the diaconate, and some are called to the episcopacy. Holy orders is the means for perpetuating the mission of Christ. No one has the right to receive holy orders. All right, I, I, you know, I did not deserve. None of us deserve to be ordained into the sacred priesthood, or to be ordained into the permanent diaconate, or to be ordained a bishop for that matter. All right, none of us has that right, and I think this is very important for us to understand because the secular world looks at the priesthood and, and you know they often say well how come only men can be ordained you know why can't women you know don't we have the right to to be ordained no you don't have the right any more than I don't have the right or men don't have the right to be ordained all right it's not a right it, it's not a you know a feather on one's cap it's not a career choice it's a calling and our Lord, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, our Lord will that men are the one who are ordained. It, you know, I can't, I can't really make it more explicit than that. That's what our Lord did. You know, um, people will say, well, you know, our Lord was under, under pressure from his society. Well, <laughs> there was a lot of things that our Lord did that went against his uh, went against went against his culture and his society, and uh, you know why would he give in and cave in to societal pressure when it came to the priesthood? The fact of the matter is is that our Lord this is what our Lord established. This is what our Lord uh, decided that only men are to be ordained. And again, it's not we don't have the right. All right, We're, we are ordained or we are called to to this ministry because God called us and desires us to serve him in this capacity holy orders again is only reserved for baptized males and the priest acts in the person of christ so let's look at uh you know the discernment for vocation so as you know you and i know a vocation is a calling all right and when god calls us to a vocation when god calls us to uh, especially to, to ministry at this altar and to his church, it's not just meant for us, all right? It's not just for our sakes, but it's always directed to the service of the church. It's always directed to the sanctification of God's people. So let's look at that. An ordained vocation. We are ordained to sanctify the church, all right? To serve, to make Christ present, to the people. Reli those who are in religious or consecrated life, it's a service to the church. And it's uh, through consecration to God. Again, there's that service. There's that, uh, you know, that, that, that action towards the other. And finally, married life. All right? We marry, not again, not just for ourselves, but to... We're called to sanctify our spouses, to sanctify one another, to help each other get to heaven, and get our children get to heaven. But also included in that, of course, is the, is the bringing forth of new life into the world, bringing new members into the church, and educating them so that they might be in a position to witness to the gospel. All right, so as you can see, th these three vocations, all right, that we have, they are all what? They, one, one thing that they have in common is that they're always directed to service to God and service to the church. It's, it's always directed to the other, and it's not just for ourselves. So which leads me to a very uh, important question. Is there such a thing as a single vocation? You know, uh, I've, I've heard this, um, use in in certain spiritual and theological circles about single vocation well the question it's, a, it's an important question to consider I'm not convinced that there is really a single vocation because a single vocation 
you know, may not be, it, it, it's hard to, to define and it's hard to, uh, it, it's hard to, um, to justify it as, as being directed to the other, being directed to the service of the church, unless, unless a person is consecrated, all right, or, or, or um, individually, uh, is an individual or a uh, consecrated virgin or, or consecrated individual. But again, even that is directed to the service of the church. So it's an interesting discussion, something to really think about. Is there such a thing as a single vocation? And if there is, how can you define and how can you justify that as directed to the other? All right. So who can be ordained? We talked about this. The church is bound to the choice that our Lord made himself, not to include women among the twelve. All right. And as I've said before, our Lord made this choice not because of societal pressure, and how do we know that? Because our Lord was always countercultural, all right? Especially in the way he interacted with women. A lot of the things that he did involved women. Who were the first witnesses of the resurrection? Women, all right? So it's not because our Lord had a hung up with, with women being in, a, uh, in, in ministry, but because this is God's plan. Even our Blessed Mother, the first disciple, was not chosen to be a priest, all right? You didn't see her go on a you know, go on a crisis or, 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 or a, uh, a protest, right? So our gender, therefore, is not uh, incidental. It, it's not something that, that's just, you know, a minor part of our identity. It's a major part of our identity. This is why the church insists that, you know, there are two genders, male and female, okay? Similar to motherhood, the priesthood is unmerited, all right, and is willed for the good of the other. Again, we, we did not do anything to deserve this call, all right. We are ordained into ministry because God called us. And this practice is part of the church's deposit of faith. Uh, it is infallible. So the permanent diaconate. Called permanent diaconate is a permanent calling. Permanent. That's why there's a word permanent. All right. It's not something that you you put away. All right. Uh, it's not something that you you just do at a certain phase in your life. It is a permanent commitment, a permanent calling to life of service and charity to the church. As I've said, the last class. The permanent deacon assists the bishop and the priests, especially in the preparation of the holy sacrifice of the Mass and in dispensing Holy Communion. Again, there's that distinct role that the deacon plays at the Mass. The deacon prepares the sacrifice, the priest offers the sacrifice. So it's important that you, God willing as a deacon, is conscious of that distinction. You know, you don't want to be doing what the priest does. You're not called to that, all right? You're called to prepare the sacrifice, and it's a beautiful calling. It's an essential calling in the life of the church. In addition to that, the deacons assist in baptism, proclaiming and preaching the gospel, and presiding over marriage and funeral rites. Lastly, they are called to various ministries of charity in the diocese or maybe even in your parish. So your role is not, uh, it's not that of governance in the church. Your role is to offer yourself in service and in charity to the parish and to the diocese. The priest is called to governance. All right? Your pastor is called to, to be the administrator to, be, to, to, to that governance. But... Uh, you as a permanent deacon, you're called to that charity and to that service. It is not to be pursued by those who feel that they didn't make the cut for the priesthood, as I've said before, or somehow once married life and priestly life. I want the best of both worlds, all right? Those are bad ways of discerning a calling to permanent diaconate. You want to be a deacon, you want to be a permanent deacon because you are called to be a deacon, all right? 
not because of those other frivolous reasons. Now, a transitional deacon is different than a permanent deacon because it is not a permanent call. A person is ordained a deacon, a transitional deacon, to prepare them for ordination to the priesthood. And again, this should only be undertaken by seminarians who are called not to transitional diaconate, but to the priesthood, all right? Um, you know, there is no, uh, you know, you're not called to permanent transitional diaconate. You're either called to permanent diaconate or to the priesthood. And so it should not just be seen as a step. Uh, and this is why if a seminarian is not sure or has some serious doubts, serious doubts about their calling to the priesthood, they should not be ordained to the transitional diaconate. All right? I mean, that that's just... Uh, uh, you know, common sense, but you know, it's very important that, that that's clear to a seminarian. Um, I remember years ago I, I, I participated in a program for seminarians, and I, I remember there was a transitional deacon who was part of that program. Well, you know, he would go to, to the gym every day, not that there's anything wrong with that, and because I, I do that as well, I go to the gym regularly. Well, when he went to the gym, you know, he met a nice young lady at the gym, all right? And uh, at the end of that program, he decided he was going to leave, the, you know, formation and, and go off with his new girlfriend. So, you know, it makes you wonder sometimes, you know, what goes on in people's minds. But I think it's very, very important that even seminarians, all right, don't ask to be ordained if you have some doubts, all right? I uh, don't just ask to be ordained because it's just another step along the way. And if somehow I meet Miss Wright, then, you know, I'm, you know, bye-bye priesthood. That's not the way it works. All right? So why men become priests? Okay, first of all, it's a calling from our Lord. Our, our Lord calls certain men to be priests. He said, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. All right? Men are attracted to the essential sacramental role of the priest that, that the priest has in the church. I know that's one of the reasons why I felt called to be a priest. I remember when, when I was uh, teaching high school, um, I, I taught a sacraments class. And, and one of the things that kept coming back to me was, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to celebrate the sacraments with my students? You know, not just talk about them, but also celebrate the sacraments. So, you know, even then, in, 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 you know, in the early stages of my calling, I had that desire uh, to celebrate the sacraments. Um, you know, don't, um, um, don't underestimate, too, the examples of those who are already ordained, including holy and dedicated deacons, all right? You, as a God willing, as a permanent deacon, you will have the, you know, the opportunity and you will see young men in your parish who might be called to the priesthood and who might be called to, to permanent diaconate. And again, it's important that you know, we, we instill and, and plant the seed in, in our young people, the young people that we will encounter in, in our parishes. Um, you know, it's not just like, well, you know, if you want married life and, and you want to be ordained, well, you should become a permanent deacon. Again, no, wrong. That's, that's the wrong way of discerning a call. All right? Uh, it, it's important that we as clergy really help the people that come to us to discern a call, to really help them, you know, be open to wherever the Lord leads them, not because, you know, we have all of these different options. So don't underestimate your role as a deacon to, uh, to inspire young men to ordain ministry. So celibacy, of course, is an important um, part of the priesthood in the Latin Rite, and even in the Eastern Rite, all right? It is the renunciation of marriage, celibacy is the renunciation of marriage made by those who receive the sacrament of holy orders for, more, for a more perfect observance of chastity. All right, the church has always considered celibacy as an, a commitment to our imitation of Christ. It is a sign of new life and service to which the church's ministry is made holy. 
It enables the priest to dedicate himself more fully to Christ and the service of the church. So he's not, you know, he doesn't have that, that, that split role between the parish and, and, and the church. Even those uh, circumstances when we do have uh, someone who was a former, let's say, former Lutheran minister and, and became a Catholic priest and if they're married and have children, even in those instances, uh, the church does not uh, take them in uh, if, if they have a lot of commitments to their families. Uh, also, um, they do not give them the same kind of workload that they would give a, a typical parish priest. Um, so those are exceptions to the rule, but as a general rule, priests are called to celibacy. They're called to celibacy because celibacy is a sign of the future kingdom. All right, our Lord said that there is no marriage in heaven. We will, there, there will be no need for marriage in heaven because we, we would be fulfilled being with the Lord. The priest is married to the church. All right, um, there is that just as Christ was married to the church as the groom and the church as the bride, the priest's bride is the church. Even those who are called to marriage, all right, must make a vow to be faithful and true to his or her spouse and family, okay? And there is no indication that married life is, is easier than celibate life, all right? I think both are, are uh, uh, you know, they're distinct callings, but both lives, married life and priestly life, both have their, their difficulties and their challenges. Um, permanent deacons can only be married once prior to ordination. Um, and if the deacon's uh, spouse passes away, that person cannot be married. This is scriptural. We had this reading uh, several weeks ago in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. A deacon may only be married once. A priest may only be married once, as St. Paul says. And those ordained are called again to be a sign of the future kingdom. Um, so this is very much rooted in scriptures. Even the Eastern and Orthodox Church, there is a special and high regard for celibacy. All right, even though the priests in in the Orthodox Church uh, can be married, they can only be married priests. Number one, if they were married before ordination, and if they're called to married life, there are certain men who are not called to married life uh, in the in the priesthood. And so only those who are celibate can become bishops. So even in the Eastern Church, in the Orthodox Church, there is a high regard for celibacy. In, in priestly formation and even in diaconate formation, there are four areas. Human formation, spiritual formation, intellectual formation, and pastoral formation. All of these areas are, are very, very important for a man or a young man being being prepared for the priesthood and being prepared for permanent diaconate. So um, you, I'm sure you've talked about this in your, in your diaconate program, but again, it's very important that all of these four areas are adequately met. The order of bishop and the priest enables the one who is ordained to act in the person of Christ. The order for the deacon is intended to assist the priests and bishops in their work. Uh, and they are ordained to act in the person of Christ the servant, if I might just add to that. The deacon is ordained to, to, uh, to act in the person of Christ the servant. In the Old Testament, when we look at the priesthood in the Old Testament, um, the, the father of the family acted as the priest. Um, and we see this in the book of Exodus. Moses selected 70 elders to help him in, in, his, in his service to his people and discerning God's will. Well, after the temple was constructed, the main role of the priest was temple duty. And we, we read that in sacred scriptures. Um, in the Old Testament, the priests and pagan priests offered sacrifices apart from themselves. They offered, you know, a goat. They offered um, a ram. They offered produce, things that were produced by the earth. 
things that were already given by God. But of course, for the priest, the Catholic priest does not offer a sacrifice apart from himself. All right? He offers the sacrifice of God himself, and he steps in in the person of Christ. And in, in a spiritual way, he also offers himself as part of that sacrifice. So the ministerial priesthood shares in this unique call. It is Christ himself who offers his unbloody sacrifice through the priest at Mass. And the apostles soon realized that, you know, in, in the early years of the church, the apostles were the first priests. And then they realized that the church, then the members of the church are beginning to increase and that they needed help in their ministry. So we, we see in sacred scriptures, we see in the Acts of the Apostles, how the apostles chose to serve, uh, how, how the apostles chose men to serve as presbyters or elders. All right, and selected other apostles, episcopoi, to succeed them, to continue their work after their deaths. And, and of course, they also selected deacons, holy deacons, to help assist in the charitable and service part of the church. So, this is just a little brief history of the sacrament. In the second century, bishops ordained priests and deacons to help him in his ministry. So we see this, uh, in the, again, in the Acts of the Apostles, and we see this in the history of the church. That there is this, this regular, um, um, you know, regular routine in the church of ordination. And, and the reason why this kind of came later, it, it, it's because the apostles thought that the parousia or the end of time was going to be happening rather quickly. They thought that, you know, our Lord was going to come back very soon. And then they realized that, okay, he's not coming back very soon and we need people to, uh, to follow after us, to continue to spread the gospel. And so this is why they began ordaining uh, more bishops priests and deacons. By the 4th century, uh, when the Christianity became more legalized, particularly in the Roman Empire, clergy gained more of a privileged sta status. All right? um, they, they act as judges. Uh, that's why they, they began wearing the, the stole, and the bishops began wearing the, uh, the mitre, which was a symbol of a Roman judge. So they, they began to, to gain more of a a privilege and a special status in the empire with the legalization of Christianity. By the Middle Ages, there was a decline in the diaconate, very interestingly enough, and it became more of a step to the priesthood rather than as one of the three degrees of the priesthood. Um, minor orders or various steps to the priesthood began to be developed. And then in the 12th century, there was the influence of um, monasticism and celibacy became a widespread requirement during this time. Not that celibacy was not already part of the life of the church. It was, all right, from the very beginning. But it became more of a widespread practice uh, during the 12th century. Council of Trent called for seminary, seminary training for priests. Many priests were not educated, many of them were not prepared or had adequate training for the priesthood and the Council of Trent um, changed that and hence you had the establishment of some of the first seminaries. Uh, one of the first seminary that was established was by St. Charles Borromeo in Milan. Um, hence that is why he is a patron saint of seminaries. And then the Second Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council restored the permanent diaconate as we saw in the early church, especially in the second century. And um, uh, so that, that role of the permanent deacon, again, was restored in, at the Second Vatican Council. And uh, Vatican II also reminded the church, not just of the ministerial priesthood that, that you know, we share, but also the common priesthood that is shared by all. So again, there are three degrees to holy orders, episcopacy, presbyterate, and diaconate. 
all right they are distinct calling they, the bishop possesses the fullness of the priesthood all right he possesses the fullness of the priesthood I share in that priesthood by assisting him so I can't operate as an independent contractor apart from the bishop my priesthood is tied to the priesthood of the bishop all right because he alone possesses the fullness of the priesthood and the deacon is ordained for charity and for service to the church for the bishop and for the priest so we talked about the the, the bishop already possessing the fullness of holy orders all right uh, normally another bishop um, is the one who ordains the bishop and during the, the ordination rite, the, the bishop receives the symbols of his office, the book of the Gospels, the ring, the mitre, and the crozier. For priests, um, again, there is the laying on of hands and the consecratory prayer. And uh, the priest receives the stole, the chasuble, and his hands are anointed with the sacred chrism. At the ordination of the deacon, again there is the laying on of hands and the consecratory prayer, and the deacon receives the book of the Gospels, all right, a stole, and a dalmatic. So the, as you can see, there are similarities to the ritual, but also distinct because it's a distinct vocation, a distinct call. So what does the sacrament of holy orders do for us? Holy orders conforms us and configures us to be more closely uh, related to Christ but it also gives us an indelible or permanent character it, it configures our soul so that you and I receive the grace to be administrators of the sacrament so the call to holy orders involves the man calls the man to become a man for others the motive for living is not for wealth or fame, but to serve the will of God. Called to genuine love of God and of others, and to live for the kingdom, and not for pleasure. And again, we, call, we, we talked about the call to celibacy. Not so much as a discipline, but to develop a greater capacity to love and as a sign for the future kingdom. The priest, when, when we... When we receive the sacrament of holy orders, we receive the grace to act as Christ as the high priest, act as, act as Christ the teacher, and act as Christ the good shepherd. And ordination leads to ministry and service. We are given the deep graces that we need to be faithful to our vocation. And we serve bishops and priests serve the people of God by teaching worship and pastoral governance ordination leads to a ministry of service service to the universal church uh, for those who are ordained as bishops bishops are made a um, member of the Episcopal College and the Pope is the head of the College of Bishops and he has the added charism of infallibility ordination also leads to service to the local church to preach the gospel to sanctify the people of God through the, through the sacraments and to govern the parish through pastoral ministry so again the job description of the priest to preach, to sanctify, and to govern. And part of that sanctification is praying for the people, the liturgy of the hours. The priest makes a promise, makes a vow to pray the liturgy of the hours five times a day on behalf of the church. You as a permanent deacon will be asked to make that same commitment but pray twice on behalf of the church. Morning prayer and evening prayer. Of course, you're welcome and encouraged to, to pray the other office, but you make a similar uh, vow uh, in the ethnic. And then lastly, some other informations in here. Some priests have served the church faithfully, 65 and above. 
Those who are vicar generals and those who hold an important office in the Vatican can be nominated for the title of Monsignor. So this was, there was a change.